me go ahead and get us get us started. So welcome. It's good to see you. I hope that you're having a very good day. I want to start us off looking at tonight. We're going to be talking about God's word a bit. In fact, most of our time will be spent on talking about God's word, why we believe the Bible. So it's probably appropriate for us to read a bit of Psalm 119. So if you have your copy of scripture, flip over to Psalm 119. I would read the whole psalm, but we don't have that kind of time. I highly recommend it, though. But let me just read beginning in verse 33. So Psalm 119, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, and in your righteousness give me life. Man, that's good stuff, isn't it? (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we are indeed grateful for your word, and we pray that prayer, Lord, that you would incline our hearts toward your word and towards you and not away from you. Lord, we pray for soft hearts and ears to hear you, that we might find our joy in you, our hope in you, and that we might be obedient sons and daughters. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at God's Word, why we believe the Bible from a couple of different sources. The first book is uh, Scott Oliphant's book, know why you believe. So we're going to be looking at the very first chapter in that book. And I do have a few copies afterwards. If you want to, to get a copy, I ordered a few from Amazon. They're nine bucks. Uh, some of you mentioned that you might want one of those. So, so uh, afterwards, feel free to get one if you want. I'm not making any money off that. They're actually a little more than that with tax. So, but, but, but nine bucks will do. The other book that we're looking at is Piper's book. And I, I hate book covers, so I ripped the book cover off. It looks better than this in real life. In fact, it looks like that. I hate book covers, so that's what I do with my book covers. Um, Anyway, A Peculiar Glory. This is my new favorite book for about the last seven or eight months. I love this book, so we'll be talking uh, through that. So, So, lesson six, why believe in the Bible? So, let's look at a couple of John Piper quotes and discuss Piper says here, faith is not a heroic step through the door of the unknown. It is a humble, happy sight of God's self-authenticating glory. So when you know, God has given us His Word, God has revealed Himself, so we're not just uh, taking chances with whether or not God exists. God has revealed him, Himself. Uh, faith is not... a a leap of faith, if you will. Here Piper defines glory. It says the glory of God is the radiance, or the going public, if you will, of God's infinite perfection and worth. And he, he gets this, of course, from several places in Scripture, but I think it's going to be valuable for us to ponder it for a moment. Um, one of the places is Psalm Of course, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the the firmament shows forth His handiwork, the Bible says. So in nature, the glory of of God is revealed. God reveals Himself in nature. If you think about throughout history, people have been able to go outside. Now, it's true less now than ever before with all the lights and the technology and things that we have But throughout human history, people have been able to go outside at night and look up and see the moon and to see the stars. We see the sun and we ponder. And this is a language in which God is saying that He is awesome. 
And he is declaring himself, declaring his glory uh, in, the, in the stars and the things that have been made. And there is no language where that is not heard and seen. And so God glorifies himself that way. But the other place, in Isaiah 6, the, the beings that are around the throne say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And one of the Piper comments on that and says, you know, so these beings are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with blank. You would expect them at that point, since they've just said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You would expect them to say the whole earth is filled with his holiness. But he doesn't. He says the whole earth is filled with your glory. So, so Piper would say, and I think he's, he's, he's probably right on this, as he is with a lot of things, um, that, the, that the holiness of God is the uniqueness of God, that he is absolutely perfect and righteous. He's, he is unique in his perfection. And so then the glory of God, which is a very tough word. We see it in Scripture. It's hard for us to kind of get our fingers around. What what is that? And so what Piper is saying there is that the glory of God is the manifestation, the radiance of God's perfection in His holiness. So that's what kind of what glory is. Typically, glory is the essence of something. The glory of something is the essence of what that thing is. So I think I gave the example one time here, the glory of an axe. You know, so we speak of the glory of an axe, we're saying, what's the essence of an axe? Well, the glory of an axe is a a sharp edge, um, a really sturdy handle, and someone that can swing it with authority, right? And so when you swing... The glory of an axe is that thwack when you, when you swing it with authority and you hit a tree and it cuts into the meat of the tree. The glory of that axe is the essence of it, the sharpness, the sturdiness of the handle when it's swung with authority. That's its glory. Now, if you take an axe that has a broken handle and you try to swing it, what you're going to see is that it's, it's lost its glory. It's lost what it was made for and what it is. So as we talk about Scripture... We're going to see that this idea of glory is going to be important. So so ponder that definition. The glory of God is the radiance or the going public of God's infinite perfection and His infinite worth. All right, so we're going to look at it. God, God reveals His glory in at least four ways, Okay. The first way is what I was talking about earlier, that God reveals His glory in the heavens. We see that in Psalm 19 for sure. We also see it in Romans 1, 19 through 21. We've talked a bit about that in the past, that God reveals His uh, infinite worth in the heavens. But He also reveals His glory in His Son. And I want to look that verse up. In Christ, the glory of God is revealed. John chapter 1. And verse 14 says, and, and, the, and the word, speaking of Jesus, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So God's infinite worth is revealed in the Son of God. And then, of course, the glory of God is revealed in the gospel. We talked a little bit about this last week, this passage. Let me, let me reread this. This is... Just a, a great paragraph of, of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 through 6. He says, In their case, the God of this world, he's talking about people who the gospel is veiled to them and they are perishing, but he says, In their, in their case, the God, little g, God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the gospel, because of its beauty, um, shines forth the glory of God when we share it. I was talking with a couple at church today and they, they had met some Mormon missionaries and they were just asking for a little bit of advice on you know, how, to, how to share the gospel with Mormons. And I'm, I'm no expert. I've had a little bit of experience with Mormon missionaries, but nothing to uh, write home about. It's not as if I've seen any of them repent and, and trust Christ, but, uh, but I have interacted with them a bit. So I had a little bit of advice, but you, you know what my, my best advice was? Listen, just share with them the gospel. You don't have to know uh, everything about Mormons to be able to help Mormons. I mean, just share the gospel like you would share it with anybody else. And the reason I would say this is that, like we were talking about last week, there is a beauty that you can't stop, that you can't inhibit when you talk about the gospel of grace. Who Jesus is, what he did, is wonderful and beautiful and has a, the glory of God on it. So um, share the gospel. So there's, there's glory in the gospel itself. And then we get to the aspect that we really want to focus in on tonight, and that's in the scriptures. So 1 John 1, 3, let's take a peek at that. So the glory of God is revealed in scripture. So 1 John Chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So the apostles who, either an apostle or someone closely related to an apostle, those are the authors of the New Testament. And so when they share with us the glory of God that they beheld in Christ and they're sharing with us about the person that they spent time with, they seen him, they heard him, they ate with him, they were with him. There's glory on that, the fact that they're sharing about Christ. And so that's what scripture is, it's especially the New Testament. The New Testament is eyewitness accounts of people who walked and talked and were with Jesus or people that were very closely associated with him. Okay? So the glory of God is on the scriptures. So listen to this. My argument, this is, this is from Piper's book, A Peculiar Glory. He says, my argument is that the glory of God in and through the scriptures is real, objective, self-authenticating reality. Christian faith is not a leap in the dark. It's not a guess or a wager. God is not honored if he is chosen by the flip of a coin. A leap into the unknown is no honor to the one who has made himself known. I think that's good. So the unique thing, one of the unique things about our Bible is that it claims to be a book that reveals what God has said in human history. God has revealed himself. And so uh, we need to receive it as such. Now, there are some reasons why we believe, but it is largely self-authenticating. I'm going to go ahead and cheat a little bit and tell you a little bit of what's to come in the, in the book, just because I, I just sense that I should. When you think about why, why, if I were to ask you, if I were to go around this room and you couldn't hear the other people's responses, if I just kind of put you on the spot and I said, do you believe the Bible is uh, reliable? Do you believe it's infallible? Do you believe it's trustworthy? And I just listened to your responses. Hopefully most of you would say yes, but then if I went further and I said, why, why do you believe that? My best guess is that you would be a lot like me in some ways, is that you would begin to stutter and stumble a bit. Some of you would be better than others. Johnny would be really good. <laughs> the rest of us would stink a bit. 
So here we are, we're, we're, we're people that most of us in this room have been Christians for more than a year or so, right? Most of us. Um, and we would say, I, I believe the Bible. If you ask me why, I would have a hard time telling you why. But I do. And Piper's just going to say this. Throughout human history, Christians have lived, suffered, struggled, had joys and sorrows, lived and died throughout human history. And they've trusted in and relied upon God's Word. And most of those people didn't know. They, did, they wouldn't have been able to write down exactly why they believed, they believed that the Bible was trustworthy, true, and reliable. But they did. And he would say it's not all that weird for us to do that. Now, we are going to learn some reasons why we should. That's, we're definitely going to do that. But I want you to relax tonight and say, you know, if you would say, you know, I, I believe God's word. I read it. I feed on it. I nourish my soul with it. I hear it preached. I, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying God's word. God's word is meaningful to me, but I don't really know why I believe it. But I do. I just do. That's pretty cool. And that's good. Because, and I would say this, and I wouldn't have been able to articulate it before, but early in my Christian life, I wouldn't have been able to give a very good answer either as to why I believe Scripture. And what, what Piper's going to say is that the Bible is self-authenticating. When we read the Bible, it's unlike any other book. And when I read the Bible as a college student, it's like the words leapt off the page into my heart. And I said, this is true. It's real. And if you read other Gospels and things like that, like the Gospel of Thomas or whatever, you read non-canonical books, they're, they're humorous. Because in comparison to Scripture, they're, they're laughable. And nobody has to really tell you, now this is a real gospel, and that's a non-real gospel. If you read them and you put them in, in comparison together, you'll, you'll know. There is, a, there is a glorious aspect to Scripture that is self-authenticating. You want to know whether the Scripture is true? Read it and obey it. Do what it says. Um, and God will reveal that to you. So there are some reasons why, in fact, we're going to look at some of those tonight, but I would say it's not a horrible thing for you to say, I love God's Word, I trust in it, I don't know exactly why I, I believe that it is. Now, I want us to be more prepared than that, because I want us to be able to give a good answer, but I'm okay with uh, Christians all over the world living and dying and yet trusting in God's Word and not, not being able to put words to it. So... Let's talk about some internal reasons. So tonight, uh, we're going to talk about some internal reasons why we believe the Bible is the Word of God and that it's reliable, trustworthy, and true. We're going to look at some external reasons. So the internal reasons first, and, and we're going to do this from the Westminster Confession a bit. So I'm, forgive me for reading from the, from the book a little bit here, but I want to do that. So the Westminster, the first reason would be the heavenliness of the, the matter. And Scott Oliphant says this, Historically, the internal evidence of the Bible's truth is focused on the unity of its diversity. For example, the Westminster Confession of Faith gives a partial list of arguments as evidence uh, to the, that the Bible is God's Word. Those arguments include, and, and let me just read from the Westminster, it says, the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof. So let's break this down a little bit. Look at each one. So. So the heavenliness of the matter is the fact that the Bible is not just a history book. It's a book given and written in history, but the subject matter of it is more heavenly than just historical. It begins in creation like Genesis 1.1, saying that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible is speaking to us of the most important matters ever. And it's not just 
earth, earthy kinds of things, you know, how to, how to have a better life, how to have a better job, those kind of things. But it's speaking to us of the most important things, the, the, the fact that God exists and the fact that our souls matter, uh, heaven and earth issues. So, so the Word of God in its content, the heavenliness of the matter, is a reason to believe in Scripture. Number two is the efficacy of the doctrine. And so he says the confession is pointing us to the application of what scriptures, Scripture teaches to the lives of the people given to us in the Bible. Throughout the Bible, we see God in relation with human beings, calling them to various tasks, enlisting their services to accomplish his purpose. Through all of Scripture, God graciously offers life. When as with Adam, the decision is made to forego that life and to choose death instead. God steps in and provides a way for life to overcome the death. And that is uh, now the natural condition of all people, Genesis 3.15. What God does in Scripture and promises through Scripture since the time when Adam brought God's good creation under a curse all point to one event, the coming of God the Son, the person of Jesus Christ. The efficacy of doctrine means that when God teaches and proclaims throughout Scripture, comes to pass. What God teaches and proclaims in the Scripture does come to pass. The efficacy of doctrine. And then third, the majesty of the style. By the majesty of style, the confession highlights the transcendent character of the truth of Scripture. Unlike the truth of the freezing point of water, the truth of Scripture points us outward and upward, beyond creation, to the very dwelling place of God. Once we grasp and own the truths of Scripture, the very style of those 66 books moves us to a life beyond ourselves and to the life that is found only in God through His Son. So majesty of style. And I think for me this is big, and I think for most... And that's this idea of the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that verse. I think it's uh, well worth, worth memorizing. And I can probably quote it, but I, I'm going to read it. Take no chances. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So the claim of Scripture itself is that the Scripture is not just the work of a mere man or mere men, but that it's breathed out by God. It is the Word of God. So the inward work of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit does reveal to us that God's Word is true and accurate. And that's part of the reason that you should give for why do I believe the Bible is the Word of God if I don't have other reasons and other sources? We would say to a certain extent that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that this is God's Word when we read it. The Holy Spirit that indwells us is telling us this is God's Word. So those are some internal reasons. I want us to look then also at some external reasons, some external reasons outside of the Bible. So those internal reasons are all things that have to do with the Scripture itself. But there are some external reasons why we believe the Bible is the Word of God also. So some examples that he gives would be the historical accuracy that we find in... Um, what, do you, what do you call it? when people are digging things up out of the ground? Archaeology, thank you, that word just escaped my mind. Archaeology, okay, yeah, historically with archaeology, digging, th digging old stuff up in the ground uh, reveals the truthfulness of God's Word. So one example he gives us is King Hezekiah's um, seal. So he says, Christianity is a religion with historical documentation that extends back through Judaism to the beginning of time. Much of Christianity's history took place in a relatively small part of the world, the Middle East. The Bible names cities and countries and regions, many of which still exist today. Archaeology, oh, it was right there. Right. Archaeology continues to, to unearth the remains of ex extinct cities, places, and cultures mentioned in the Bible. For example, 
The Bible states in three different books that King Hezekiah reigned over Judah. That's in 2 Kings chapter 17 through 20, Isaiah 36 through 39, and 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. Recently, an archaeological dig in Jerusalem discovered a seal that belonged to him with the inscription, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Now, when I was in college, I took an Old Testament class at Auburn. By the way, you should never do that. Never, never take, <laughs> never take a, a Bible class at a secular university unless you want to, to experience the onslaught of some, some junk. Well, I, I foolishly did, and my professor was, a, was a, an, a Methodist minister who did not believe the Bible whatsoever. And I remember in that class, him, one of the things he brought up was, the Bible talks about King Hezekiah. We can't find any reference to King Hezekiah. Well, guess what? Since the 80s, they've dug up stuff. So, and there it is. They found a seal with him. So anytime somebody says, well, there's something mentioned in the Bible and we don't have any historical record of it, therefore it must not be true. Man, put a pause on that. Just wait, you know. They just need to get to digging. Uh, they're probably going to dig something up. So they have since then. Um, another example would be, and, and I've heard this too, people say, we don't really have any record of King David. We've got to, have you heard that? People say, we don't, we don't, I mean, it's just a story in the Bible. We don't really know if, if David existed. Well, there's, they found an inscription containing the, ha- the phrase, the house of the King of David. Listen to this. Archaeology keeps adding more and more support to the Old Testament narratives. In the 1990s, an inscription was found that confirmed the existence of the house of King David, which is discussed in the books of the Old, Old Testament. So, so just archaeology outside of the Bible is revealing that the names of cities and places and people are confirmed in the Bible with incredible reliability. And even some things that in my lifetime people did not believe in. In my lifetime, they've dug them up, and, and now they go, okay, we can check that one off. Hezekiah, you know, was a real guy. So was David. Um, so that's, that's some evidence to the reliability of the Bible. Now let's look at some more historical documents, and that would be through Josephus. Most of you have probably heard of him. He was a Jewish historian that lived in the first century. So regarding the history of the New Testament, there are at least three records describing the existence of Jesus Christ and his followers done by, done by men outside of Christianity. So each one of these historical writers were not Christians. And so they're affirming the truthfulness or the validity of some things that are in the Bible, even though they're not Christian writers. So the first one is Josephus, who lived about A.D. 37. It says, Jewish, Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote that Jesus was a man who did wondrous works and whose followers said that he was the Messiah. Josephus also recorded the fact that Jesus was put to death by Pilate. Okay, so that's significant. So the Bible tells us that Jesus was, was put to death by Pilate as well. So now here's an author outside of the Bible that is confirming what the Scripture tells us, and he's not a Christian writer. So there are people, there are actually people that will make the claim that Jesus never existed. Well, here's Joseph. You might encounter that as you're doing evangelism and as you're reaching out, you might find an, an atheist that says, man, we don't even have proof that Jesus even was a real person. That stuff in the Bible is made up. You could say, well, have you ever heard of Josephus? He wasn't a Christian and he wrote about Christ. And he wrote in the, in the first century, so he would have known. He lived in the time of Jesus. He wasn't a Christian. And he mentions it. He mentions that Jesus was put to death by Pilate. Another one is Tacitus, who lived in A.D. 56 through 120. Also not a Christian. He described the first century persecution of Christians, and he attributed the Christian movement to Jesus Christ, a Jew who was killed under Pontius Pilate. So here's another non-Christian affirming the, the New Testament and, and the Gospels. And then, so the last one, Pliny or Pliny, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Is it, is it Pliny? Any idea? No, no guess difference. <laughs> so he lived, <laughs> good luck with that, uh, AD 61 through 112. I think Pliny is probably plenty. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> lived AD 61 through 112, recorded the continuation of Christianity into the second century. And he wrote that Christians were meeting weekly 
to worship Christ as if he were a god. Can you ponder that? So here's a non-Christian writer observing Christians after the resurrection of Christ and his ascension, that they're meeting together and they're wor- they're, they're, they, when they meet together and when they worship, they worship Christ as if he were a god. Okay, so it's affirming some of the things that are in the Bible. So those are some external reasons. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about even more historical documentation, and one of those would be the Dead Sea Scrolls and their affirmation of the Old Testament. With respect to the Old Testament, much of its confirmation can be found in the New Testament. From Jesus to the apostles, the attribution of authority and divinity to the Old Testament is beyond doubt. So when we read the New Testament, you look at what what was Jesus' view of the Old Testament. If you read the Gospels and you see that, Jesus had incredible confidence in the Old Testament. He'll say, Moses said, Abraham saw. Jesus affirms, he, he, he affirms Noah, he affirms uh, Jonah. You know, Jesus is, just speaks of the Old Testament as if it's, if, as if it's Scripture. And, and the other authors of the New Testament do as well. So we would say uh, that's certainly true. So from Jesus to his, apostles, to his apostles, the attribution of authority and divinity to the Old Testament is beyond doubt. As for external testimonies to its authority... The discovery from about, eight, from about 1946 to 1956 of various caves in the West Bank that contained what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 40s and the 50s. Added significant and substantial support for the reliability of the Old Testament. Of the 11 or so caves containing ancient manuscripts, Cave 5 housed what is thought to be the oldest Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament, a fragment of the book of Samuel from the 3rd century B.C. The cave also contained hundreds of copies of various books of the Bible, adding up the entire Old Testament except for Esther. In addition to the manuscripts found in the caves near the Dead Sea, there are thousands of other manuscripts that confirm the accuracy of the words given in the Old Testament. So this is what, I, what he's saying. He's saying when, so they had copies of the Old Testament before 1946 and 1956. But when they found these, some of these are older than the other ones that they have. And when they compare, they're very similar. They're not large disagreements. So, so the Dead Sea Scrolls affirm the reliability of the Old Testament Scriptures. So we have copies of Scripture from different time periods, and there's incredible agreement. So uh, often when you're talking with an unbeliever, they'll say something like this. Well, the Bible's been corrupted by people throughout all the years. And it would be good for you to say, have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? They were dug up in the 40s and 50s. And they dug up some really old manuscripts. And those old manuscripts that they didn't have before, they didn't vary a whole lot from what we already had. So this tells us that you're wrong. It hasn't been corrupted through the years. Yes, I would say, yes, there are differences. You know, there are copyist errors and stuff like with a letter here, a letter there. But the, but the message is intact. It's, it's there. So that's a, that's a good thing that you could say about the Bible. Then the other thing is, is talking about the New Testament. He says, the sheer number of manuscripts available to confirm the New Testament is overwhelming when compared with similar documents. Counting only texts written in Greek, there are at present 5,686 manuscripts that copy part or all of the New Testament, some dating to perhaps the first century, he says. So we have almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, all written from different time periods. And there's not a lot of dissimilarity. They're very much alike. And so this is supportive of the reliability. So again... This would be something to, you could bring up with somebody who says, well, the Bible's just written by men, and it's been changed, and by that it doesn't even agree. People have corrupted it. So he says, by contrast, the second most documented work from this time period is Homer's Iliad, which has 646 supporting manuscripts. 
Now, I read Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey when I, was in, uh, at, when I was at Auburn in my English classes, and nobody ever raised their hand and said, well, you know, there's only about 600 copies of this. How do we know that what we're reading here is true? And yet there are almost 6,000 manuscripts, and people bring that up. Well, they're, if they're, they're going to be really different because it's just written by a man. You know, it's funny. That we, don't, <laughs> that we don't use the same sort of criticism towards Homer. And yet the reliability of Homer is far below the reliability of, of the Bible's manuscripts. Other works have far fewer manuscripts. There are only 10 copies of Julius Caesar's Gallic War. I've never heard that argument with, with uh, Julius Caesar's Gallic War at all. Uh, eight copies of uh, Thucydides' History and only two copies of the annals by Tacitus. So, so the reliability of the Bible is, I think, beyond question in terms of like what we have. Is, it, is, is what we have the same as what the originals were? I think because of the, the number of the copies and uh, the agreement that we can, we can have great confidence, I think, in uh, the Scripture. Okay, let me take just a minute here at the end to kind of go away from this. By the way, the homework for this week will be to continue reading Know Why You Believe, if you have that copy or if you want to get one today. I would say keep reading that, but for next week, we're going to talk, Lord permitting time, chapter 2 and chapter 3 from Piper's book, A Peculiar Glory, because we want to continue talking about the Scripture What's included in the Old Testament? Why we believe that? Why, why do we believe we have the proper books in the Old Testament canon and the New Testament? And that's what he covers in chapter 2 and 3. But I would say slowly read this. At some point we'll come back to this. And this is just really helpful information in uh, Oliphant's book as well. But let me just pause and get back to evangelism for a moment if I could. One visual, um, simple way to share the gospel with someone, even with children on a napkin at a restaurant, is what I'm going to show you right here. And it's, it's a way to share the gospel with just one Bible verse, Romans 6.23. Hopefully you're familiar with that verse. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, what I would do is I would, I would draw this on a piece of paper, put Romans 6, 23, and I would say the verse. And then uh, draw a little cliff over here, and a cliff over here, put God on that side, us on this side. This is a real simple explanation of the gospel. And so I might draw that and then quote Romans 6, 23 one time. And then the next thing I'm going to do is as I say the verse the second time, I'm actually going to write these words down. So I'm going to say the wages... I write, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this gives me a chance to, to talk about wages. What are wages? Well, wages are things that you earn when you work for something. And what is sin? Well, sin is us not obeying God and His commands. It's us missing the mark of living up to loving God with our whole heart. It's us seeking to find our joy and pleasure and hope in other things. We worship the cre created things instead of the Creator. Um, this is sin, to, to miss the mark, to disobey God. And that results in death. In fact, that's the reason I put God over here and us over there, is that this death is a spiritual death because we're alive, but yet Ephesians 2 says we're dead in transgressions and sins. So I would say this, the, the payment, the just payment, for the sin that we have committed is separation for God. So this is our condition, is that there's a huge uh, chasm between us and God due to our sin. The, the payment, the just payment of our rebellion against God, our trying to live in autonomy, do our own thing with God, is the fact that we are separated from God and we're incapable of knowing Him and enjoying Him. The wages of sin is death. But it's not just that. It's that... There's coming a time when Christ comes back in which we're all good. there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. And this death is not just going to be a physical separation from God that's, that's here and now, but it's an eternal 
separation and judgment from God. So he says there's a lot that you can do to fill in the outline here in talking about what wages sin and what death means in terms of the bad news side of the gospel. The wages of sin is death. So this is really bad news. But the good news side of this is, so the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this gives you an opportunity to, for you to talk about the fact that salvation, being made right with God, is not something that you earn, but it's, it's a gift. That's what a gift is. is it's, it's a free gift, a free gift by the grace of God. So the gift of God is eternal life. So this is a life that's filled with knowing God and enjoying God now and in eternity. And Jesus said, this is eternal life. In John 17, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So when I'm talking about eternal life, I'm talking about a quality of life now, knowing God and a duration of life. When I took... Um, Greek, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask the uh, Greek professor was what, eternal life. In the Greek, that word eternal, is that just duration or is that quality? Because at the time I was, I was interacting with um, some different cult people and they were, they were trying, they were expressing some different ideas. So I wanted to know, what, what is that? And, and that's what he affirmed. So this guy that had a, had a doctorate and uh, was teaching us Greek, he said, no. That word eternal life is talking about quality of life and it's talking about duration. Both of those elements are involved. So we're saying the gift of God, for by grace are you saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 is a good scripture to bring up here. In Christ Jesus. So this salvation is in Christ. So this is kind of a simple outline and drawing with one verse if you don't have a lot of time or you're, you're sitting down at a table you have some paper it's kind of a clear uh, description of the gospel in one verse and so the cross bridges uh, the gap between God and us so that we can have fellowship with God this the navigators of course have a much more extensive um, application of this is kind of an adaption of the bridge they're their example is much more thorough and all. But this is just kind of a simple, brief way with just one verse to, to share the gospel. So I have shared it different ways with this, with people. It's not my preference. I'd rather sit down with somebody and share like I showed you the outline before and be very, very thorough. But if I only have just a little bit of time, we've used this. One of the ways we've used this is that every year we do a little outreach with... Um, some of the churches in Santa Rosa County where we do a gas buy down. And so we, we have 20 bucks on gift cards and we're going to different gas stations and we're asking people if we can buy them $20 of gas. And while we're pumping the gas, I'll have a, a, a yellow pad and I'm drawing this with a marker. So I'm saying, hey, while we're pumping the gas, can I talk to you about Jesus? And I don't have, you know, I've got like a minute and a half to share the gospel while somebody else is pumping the gas. And so I'll actually share it this way, just this one verse and draw it out. So if you've only got a minute and a half or two minutes, three minutes or whatever, this, this is a way of communicating the message of the gospel, that, it, that it's by grace and uh, the, the bad news of the gospel and the good news of the gospel. Well, any, any quick questions before we break, before Johnny comes? Is there anything you'd like to ask or, or add? All right, well, let's, let's, thank you for being here. Let's take a little break before Johnny comes.